the way I start a book is um, I like to pretend it's not a book, first of all, that it's just a, a longer story than usual. And I might take a couple of pages of notes. I write on a stenographer's notepad, small pages, so it's easier to fill them. And I try not to get too intimidated by the whole process by just keeping it within the moment. I'm just get, trying to get, as a writer, I'm just trying to get to the next word. And, and trying to get it through the magic of the characters. Six Figures is called Six Figures for two reasons. One is the monetary issue. This is a couple that wants to make six figures. And the other is that there were six different points of view that I was writing from in the drafting of this novel. The two grandmothers, the two parents, and the two kids. Well, one kid is four or five, and the other kid is, you know, one year old. And so in the revision process, the one year old got dropped. And I seem to be the only one aware that the Six Figures was about the six different points of view. And uh, so we kept the title Six Figures, but we lost his point of view. Writing is about time and space. So we talked about the spatial constraints, and then there's a the temporal issue, right? And for me, I like to write at the same time every day for about 45 minutes to an hour. And if you enter that time at the same time every day, you're going to enter the same sort of mental space, or at least you hope to. And that's why you can get a lot done quickly. I only read what I've written the day before, and I'm only trying to write whatever I can write in 45 minutes to an hour. And so sometimes it's 500 words, and sometimes it's 50 words, sometimes it's a sentence, and sometimes it's nothing. As a writer, if all you're trying to do is get to the next word, then anything that takes you to the next word is a good thing. And then uh, my argument about revision is that it's so much easier to create something from something than it is to create something from nothing. So as long as it's out on the page, even if it's a mess, it's better than having nothing on the page. And that's one way to get out of the whole uh, inner critic issue. I remember in Six Figures, I drafted like seven or eight pages that I knew were disgusting and terrible and awful. And, but they got me to the next sequence. And it was something about it. This guy ran this uh, nonprofit organization, and someone who made pork sausages wanted to enlist his services. It made no sense, but it got me into the next scene eventually. I love to teach, and uh, teaching demands a different a perspective on writing every moment that you enter that classroom, every moment that you're in the classroom, because you're appealing to a different intellect each time you talk about someone's writing. You're, you're appealing to that person, and you're trying to appeal to everyone else in the room. And uh, when you're writing, you're appealing to a reader. But some of those readers are going to be some of those people in that room. And so that informs your writing as well. But, um, you know, they say, I say that the first draft is what does the character want? And my friend Elizabeth Strout, who wrote uh, the best-selling book, Amy and Isabel, says the second draft is what does the reader want? And so teaching is a form of fusing those two approaches, because you're alone, what does the character want? You're with somebody, what does the reader want? And I always tell my students that the purpose of the workshop, the way uh, generally creative writing is taught, is you distribute the work in advance, everyone reads it, and they come in, they discuss it. I ask my students to discuss it first in terms of its aboutness. What is the work about, both literally and figuratively? How is it achieving what it's about? And what are the opportunities for revision? That's the way we try to talk about the work in our workshops. Um, and so when I talk to our students about the purpose of the workshop, I say it's for the writer to learn whether intent marries effect. Because all the readers will give him or her what they believe to be the intent and go from there. And you really get to see your audience and hear your audience. And it can be, as long as you don't take it personally, it can be an incredibly valuable experience. It's a real opportunity to read a review of your own work, because you don't know the reviewers. And uh, they're responding to your work as if you're not there. And uh, so it's like having another workshop. I do read all the reviews of my work. When it's really bad, sometimes I'll just, and my agent will tell me in advance, or my editor will tell me in advance, oh, you just got a really bad review. I'll just lay down on the floor and read it on my back so I can't fall any farther, you know? And if it's good, you just kind of take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you know, I remember, uh, I guess when I got a really great review in the New York Times, I remember 
I hadn't quite seen it, but it had been faxed home, and when I got home, um, my wife had it there with a bottle of champagne, so that was very nice. Um, but you, you have to learn to balance the good with the bad and, and not take it all too seriously. I always find that my next book is dedicated <laughs> to trying to address the things I did quote unquote wrong in the previous book. And that's a pretty funny way to write. And not the, not, it's not recommended. My wife has always been my first and best critic. Uh, she reads almost everything I write. I mean, there, there's, there's been a point where it's been overload. And so, for both of us, she's a writer too. She writes nonfiction. And, uh, and, and she's also a poet, actually. And uh, well-published in both. And we went to the Iowa Writers Workshop together. Before that, we met at the Johns Hopkins University Writing Seminars, which was at that time a one-year graduate program. And so uh, she's always the first and best critic. But the ultimate reader for me is my agent. She is a very demanding critic. She has a huge list. She represents, you know, Toni Morrison and Richard Ford and uh, Brett Easton Ellis and Jay McInerney and all these people. I guess she must have maybe 200 clients, and she is incredibly quick. I can send her a novel, and she'll respond to it within two weeks. I can send her a 40-page story, and she'll read it on the plane from here to there, you know, and I'll get it. I'll get a reaction to it almost instantly. So, um, or 33 pages was what that story was. But um, she's incredibly quick. The amazing thing about her, too, is that she reads all these magazine pieces I write, too. Even though I just work with a serial agent on those, and with my editors at the magazine, she'll read them, and she'll, she'll weigh in on them. If she doesn't like something, she'll let me know, and she'll let me know why. I would hear from uh, people in the film industry fairly regularly about the book, but no one picked it up. And then I got this letter from this Canadian guy who sounded very passionate about it. And around the time that that letter arrived and he was making a bid for the book, Hollywood was supposed to go on, the writers in Hollywood were going to go on strike and they were going to grind everything to a halt in Hollywood. So my agent took a look at me and I took a look at her and she, we said, well, why not give the Canadian a try? Nothing will probably happen anyway. And in six months, you can resell it to an American filmmaker. <laughs> Turned out that the Canadian went ahead and made the movie. It took him three and a half years, but he kept renewing the option, which means it was always his to do. And he finished it uh, in May of 2005, I guess, uh, and then finished post-production on it uh, in time to submit it for the Toronto Film Festival at the last minute. And it premiered there. I mean, just literally, it just made it into there in mid-September of 2005. I'm going to read from the opening of Six Figures, which pretty much sets the time and the place and the quandary for these two particular characters. The line for the polling booths at Charlotte Baptist Church was more than a hundred people long, and Warner Lutz rocked the unsettled baby in his arms while studying the diverse messages posted around Fellowship Hall. Pray for God to bring the lost and hurting people from your community to himself. Anger is just one letter from danger. Every half minute, a blue light blinked, and the next person would enter a vacated stall, drawing the curtain closed. At the far end of the auditorium, uniformed children paraded across a stage under a green and white banner that said, Kids can vote too. A handful of Girl Scouts guarded a cardboard ballot box, cheerfully distributing sharpened yellow pencils with pink eraser tips. In Boston, Warner and Megan had voted at a public elementary school in San Francisco in a row house garage. The other day, a moneyed pastor had told him that Charlotte liked to view herself as a conservative town who loved her churches on every street corner, and Warner had felt the Jew in him cringe in a kind of fear, and the atheist in him vow to do something anarchic about it. From the start, he and Megan had been torn between blending in and pushing out, but he was feeling increasingly damned if he was going to assume his born into religion just because everybody around him seemed to put so much stock in theirs. All along the length of the hall, his neighbors chatted quietly as they smoothed the minor fault lines in the creases of their business suits or sweater sets, double-checked the coordination of their wristwatches and cufflinks or necklaces and earrings. Behind him was Megan in her faded jeans and baby-stained cardigan. She leaned forward and lightly breathed into his ear. He's asleep. <laughs>